Welcome to the Candle Business Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Kirsty Allen, and I am the Candle Business Coach. I'm also a mum of three and a kindness advocator. This podcast is all about making and selling candles, business development, and mindset, delivered to you with advice, inspiration, and motivation in a new episode every Friday. This episode is brought to you by the membership for candle makers, the Candle Makers Collective. Becoming a member gives you access to fortnightly online group Q&A coaching sessions to support you, monthly online workshops and trainings to help you grow your business, plus frequent expert guest speakers to inspire and teach you. You'll also have access to an ever-growing resource library with templates, guides, planners, and eBooks. But my favorite aspect of the membership is our exclusive Facebook group for accountability, connection and support. So if you're looking to take your candle business to the next level and learn more about the membership for candle makers, click the link in the show notes for the candle makers collective. Welcome back to the podcast, my friend. Tonight, I'm very excited to announce that we have another Candlemaker Connections episode, this time with the beautiful Alicia Sue and a new voice to the podcast uh, for the Candlemaker Connections episodes <laughs> is Jenny. So guys, do you want to say hello to the listeners? Hey, hello. Hey. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so this is the third episode in this series that we're recording. And when um, we were chatting before recording about what we wanted to talk about tonight, we all agreed that it would be great if we could just touch on and actually deep dive rather into some points to help the newer candle makers. So some tips on the actual like mechanics and the science behind making, but also how to grow a business and how to figure out just everything really. So before we start chatting about making candles and how to actually create our products, I wanted to touch on some important overarching themes when it comes to running a business or more specifically a candle business. So the first one is knowing your why and why you want to sell candles. Ladies, do we want to share our why with the group? Absolutely. So why? Why do I want to sell candles? Because I absolutely love them. It gives me joy. I love meeting the customers and it's just fabulous. What about you, Jenny? Why candles? I started making candles as a kind of therapy when I was unwell many, many years ago and it just became something that I loved doing. But in terms of selling them, I sell them because I'm personally sensitive to artificial fragrance and synthetic fragrances and I can't burn most candles. So I've gone down the route of just making candles with natural fragrance oil. And so that took a lot of investigation and um, some deep diving into sourcing and finding suppliers and checking out ingredients and all of that. And that was why I went to market really to provide something for people like me. And what about you, Alicia? Out of all the different products in the whole wide world, how did you settle and why did you settle on candles? Well, candles, it definitely started as a hobby, but then my brother and sister pushed it into a business. But I think that like the why at the end of the day, it's honestly selfish. It's more for me and my mental health than anything. It's incredible. And we've touched on this in the past on the podcast, how therapeutic it is making candles and losing yourself in the process of getting the ingredients and the supplies together and mixing it all in, you know, in a big pot or on a double boiler and then making a beautiful product at the end that you can then share with your customers. So Knowing what your why is, is such an important part of the journey and it will really ground you in the hard times and it will help motivate you when things are going really well. So I think that's really important if you don't quite know what your why is to maybe even pause this podcast, pull out your journal and write down some thoughts and some feelings around why you're doing it, what's your motivation, what's your true intention because if you don't know why you're doing it, It will be really hard for your customers to follow along and be a part of your journey because you need to have that, you need to have that passion and that drive. Another thing that's really important when it comes to having a business or even just having a a hobby of candle making is to have goals. And it's important to set both short, medium and long-term goals. So I'd love to know, ladies, is that something that comes easily to you, whether you're you just know in your head what your goals are or is it something that you just go in with the flow and seeing where the journey takes you 
For me, it, it doesn't come naturally. Uh, the, the business side of it is something that I've really had to work very hard on and I'm doing a certificate for of entrepreneurship at the moment. So I'm being taught a lot about setting goals and it's something that I need to keep referring back to as well because in my mind I just like making candles and I like selling them and I don't really think about the end game so much. So, yeah, it's something that I have to continually work on. What about you, Alicia? For me, I have the goals in my head but they're always moving and changing. So Mm -hmm. I feel like I have a goal, but then I adjust it with, I guess, my expectations and reality as things happen. I think that's really important as well is to be flexible with your goals and not be tied down to a specific deadline. I mean, yes, deadlines are great. It can help to motivate us, but It is our own business and we can move the goalposts a little bit. We change the direction that we want to move towards. It's up to us to figure out what that is for us and our journey. But what about you, Sue? Does it come easily to you, goal setting? I usually write my goals down. So the ultimate goal has always to be in making candles long term so I can do it when I retire. But I do have weekly goals, monthly goals, six monthly goals. So I have to write it down, otherwise it wouldn't come easy. That's a really good point. Getting it out of our minds and onto paper, it helps to bring clarity to our thoughts and our feelings as well because it just gets out of our head and it can let, it can, you know, be structured a little bit more clearer. And then once you know what your goals are, it's a lot easier to then take the action to get towards your end point. Other things that are important that it, when it comes to having a business is obviously the testing side of things, not only your candles itself, but the testing process of figuring out who your ideal market is, asking questions of those people to figure out what scents they like, what sort of aesthetic for the jars and all the different aspects. Do you find the testing process tests your patience? I would say no, I love the testing part. I get to test candles in the house all the time, so the house is always looking pretty. I've always looked at testing as a positive thing. So, yeah, testing doesn't worry me. I think the hard part about testing is documenting everything, writing it all down, taking photos and being consistent with that and then coming back and I test seasonally. So coming into summer I'll retest and then coming into winter So, yeah, no, I love the testing. Such a good attitude and perspective to have as opposed to thinking it's wasted time, wasted product, wasted money. It's flipping that on its head and really looking at it from a perspective of this is an essential part of having a candle business. It's just one of the things that needs to be done regularly and consistently to ensure I'm creating safe products for my customers. I agree with Sue there, I have to say. I love the testing process as well. The sciencey part of it, if something's not quite right, you get to tweak things here and there and figure out. I, I love putting my mad scientist hat on and getting into my lab and, and figuring things out. But I think where it, it can trip people up is if you don't expect to have such a long, it is a long testing process for, for most people. And if you go into it knowing that and not having a, a set time in mind, I suppose, where you need to be done by, then it's a lot more freeing in that way because you're not panicking because you don't know what's going to go wrong and what's going to go right. And if you can love the process, then it really helps to smooth out that journey. Mm. What about you, Alicia? I'm so impatient that I get sick and tired of scents if they are sitting in my house for too long being tested. (laughs) So it kind of, I start to look at it and be like, oh, I'm so over you, you stupid candle. Like, just hurry up and work. (laughs) (laughs) It's very, very realistic and very relatable. (laughs) I'm sure the listeners are nodding their head going, yep, that's where I am right now. Like it's the beginning of my candle journey or, you know, a little bit down the line and testing a new fragrance or um, a new range of products. And yeah, it can be, it's a process. But I think, as you say, Jenny, it's really important to know that it's, it's going to take time, it's going to take resources, it's going to take mental strength and patience and being aware of it when you go into it, I think, is is the main part. If you think that you might make a couple of candles and try it a couple of different waxes and then you're just going to perfect the formula and just get it right for where you are and what ingredients you're using, if you've got that perspective or that idea that that's what's going to happen for you, you'll most likely be disappointed and frustrated 
by the fact that it does take longer than you think because everyone is in a different part of the world. We're using, you know, we're using similar ingredients uh, or similar supplies, but the way that we're making it, you know, as you say, Jenny, like those small scientific differences, you can't, like it, it's just, it's a process and it does take a lot of resilience, I feel. It can be frustrating at times too. You think you've got the wick nailed. You're into maybe the fourth burn and then the fifth burn. It starts to drown and you think, why? You know, so it can be frustrating. Absolutely. I've never been a patient person either and I've learned a lot through this that you just have to have a lot of patience and a lot of grace. <laughs> well, you don't have the patience and you feel frustrated and that's fine as well. Yeah, you got to feel your feelings, guys. Let them, let them all out. <laughs> just don't get mad at the little candles. It's not their fault. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd love to know what sort of mistakes are common for the beginner candle makers when they first start their journey. I think sometimes when you're looking at a jar and they recommend the wick for the jar, like a candle company recommends a wick for the jar, I don't think people realise that, that every scent needs to be tested with a different wick regardless of the jar, you know. So just because they say it's a CDN 10 or LCS 90, you still need to test it. That's There's no quick fix. I've got certain jars. I would say I've got my extra large jar and I do that in six different fragrances. I probably use three different wick types across that. Mm. So I use ACS, LCS and HTP. And not one of them is the same. So I've probably got six different wick types within the one candle jar mm. just because it's so dependent on the fragrance oil and you mm. you don't realise that starting out. You think fragrance is fragrance and a candle is a candle and it's just not. Absolutely. And it's the recommendation is a starting point. It's not an end yes. point. It's mm. not a guarantee that it's going to work for you. Even if you have to wick up just one or, or wick down just one, that's still two candles that you're testing. That's at a minimum. Even if you get, you know, even if the unicorn has come out from the sky and you get this perfect burn on the first candle that you make with that particular fragrance oil in that particular jar with that particular wick, you still need to test it again to ensure that it's going to be consistent. It's not just I've nailed it on the first try, move on to the next fragrance because I have, you know, 20 fragrances in my range and I need to move on to the next. Just slow down take your time and enjoy the process of the testing phase and don't worry too much about frosting or wet spots or making them perfect, quote unquote, because if you think back to when before you were a candle maker, the chances of you noticing those things is very, very slim. So your customers aren't going to not buy a candle based on the aesthetic. So don't get caught up in that small stuff. The main thing is you want to make a safe candle. You don't want to make something that's going to have a really large flame or get really hot to the touch. Like there are, you know, there are these key things that we need to make sure that we're making that safe product. But Alicia, let me know, what do you think are some common mistakes that candle makers in their beginning stages make? I'm going to say social media. Yeah. You can okay. get wrong. I think that they sell too easily or they try to make a sale like by posting an Instagram post and being like, buy this candle it's on my website now but I personally wouldn't see an Instagram post and go buy something I need to know exactly what it is and I need to like have a connection with that brand so I think they use social media incorrectly by expecting people to buy without offering them anything else that's a really good point it's not about you just opening your website and telling people that it's open and then the sales start rolling in if it was yeah. that easy, everyone would have a business and everyone would be raking in the dollars. You've got to add value to your audience and you've got to give something to receive something. You know, go to other people's accounts, follow, like, comment, interact, as well as your business. You want to make sure you're actually offering something that is of value to your customers and followers. All right, so let's go back to basics. What equipment do we need when we start our journey? What's actually essential and what can we work our way up towards? Essential is a pot. You're probably going to start with the double boiler method. You can get a cheap saucepan from the op shop. It's a great way to start. You don't want to be using the, the pot that you use in the kitchen as well. Get something separate. Get yourself something old and battered. It's totally fine. So that is definitely essential, as is something to melt your wax in. So you, you could use a glass Pyrex jug. You want to make sure that it's something that's not going to break. So if you're using glass, you want Pyrex or Borosilate, is that how you say it? Borosilate? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. The, there's a kind of glass that doesn't shatter anyway. Or a stainless steel jug is great. You can get a cheap stainless steel jug from Kmart, somewhere like that, or from the candle supply shops. They do them as well. Those are essential. And a good set of scales. I would agree with both of those. What about you, Alicia? Just trying to think of what equipment I bought when I first started. I'm pretty sure I, I purchased an aluminium pot and scales. I got spatulas from Kmart to mix with and I still use those to this day. I use them um, too. Yeah, they're so cheap and easy. And then I think that's the basics for wax. Heat gun. Heat yeah. gun. Yeah, heat, heat gun's gun. essential. Don't use a blow dryer. Do not <laughs> use a hair dryer, guys. No, it will not. spray the wax everywhere. It will walls, cause yeah. Yeah, yeah. massive issues. You, you must buy a heat gun. It doesn't have to be from a candle supply. You can go to Bunnings. No. Yeah, you um, can. And they're all pretty much the same. It doesn't matter what brand it is. So don't get caught up on you have to have the latest and the greatest equipment. A wax melt is a dream to have. And when you've got it, you'll you'll know how amazing it is. But you don't have to start off with that. That's a big, bigger investment than starting off with a double boiler method. Make a few candles before you commit to your business as well, because you might start making them and realize, okay, this isn't quite for me. But then again, if you listen to this podcast and you listen to this episode, you, you're probably already in love with it all. <laughs> I doubt we've got some very, very initial list, uh, listeners that haven't yet made a candle that have, what, that have listened to all these episodes. But um, stuff like a thermometer, a laser thermometer, you can get those pretty cheap. They're, they're really great because you need to obviously, the temperature control is such a huge factor in making candles and melting the wax and knowing when to add the fragrance oil and and all of that but most of the candle making kits that are out there have 90 percent of what you need it's just a few extra things that you'll need along the way but speak to your candle supplier find out what they recommend and then make a decision as to whether it's essential from the beginning of the journey or when you can when you're a little bit further along such as a wax melter I think maybe a um some type of wick centering tool as well, even if it's just those silly little popsicle sticks to start off with, like just something so you know where the wick should be and then you can work your way up to like the quick wick or something. Yes, yes, definitely. Because you'll, you'll do your head in if the wick isn't centered and, you you know, you've, you think you've got it centered and then the wax sets and you look at it and you're like, that's not quite centered. So, yeah, so definitely use a popsicle stick or those metal centering tools. Yeah. So, yes, the quick wick as well is definitely handy. And I actually, I actually learned something new about how to center wood wicks for any listeners that use that is that you literally just use two rubber bands. So you've got your jar, you've got your wick in the jar, and then you put your rubber bands on the outside of like on either side of the wick and then you can adjust the rubber bands to make it stay in the same like in the in the middle so I thought that was um, a very handy I've, tip. I've got a good tip for beginners when it comes to um, sticking your wick down as well and centering it if you don't have a device yet go to the internet google bullseye print out a sheet with a bullseye on it and then you can stick your jar on that so you just pop it down on the table stick your jar on top and then you can center it and it's a really great free way of making sure that you're sticking your wick down dead center there's so many little tricks and tips that you pick up along the way and even if we shared all of our, you know, candle making secrets some of them aren't going to apply to some of the listeners anyway so it's more about taking what you need to and figuring out and just you know, discovering your best way of being the most efficient and making the best candles that you can. One thing that's really important, we touched on it before, is being safe, not only when making candles, but then when the candles are being burnt as well. What are some safety precautions that candle makers should be aware of? The first thing I did was put a fire extinguisher near my candle making space because I'm paranoid. And if a fire was to break out I would want that and make sure you get the correct fire extinguisher because different fires have different ways of putting it out that was number one for me very good tip what about you Jenny ventilation crack a window if you can then then some kind of uh electronic system is probably great I don't have anything like that in place myself at the moment but I always have a window cracked even if I'm not working with fragrance oil and I'm just, I've got my electric hot plate in my studio and I'm doing double boiler method, or if I've got my uh, my wax melter going, then there's always some kind of uh, vapors in the air. So crack a window, make sure you've got good ventilation. And it's especially important when you're working with fragrance oils. 
And what about you, Sue? I wear heat-proof gloves when I'm making the candles. You know, you're picking up your jugs from uh, the double boiler if you're using the double boiler. I also hot glue my wicks down. So sometimes I had one instance once where it was a brand new wick and the tab came off and it was filled with um, hot glue, landed on my finger, nasty. So since that day, I've always worn gloves. I will not, will not pick up the hot glue gun without my gloves. In regards to making the different types of candles, like pillar and jar and tea light and, and all the different types, what do you think is the most beginner friendly? Jars. Jars? I'd say jars too. Yeah. Pillars, I think, have a lot more of a learning curve to them and it can be really disheartening when they break coming out of the moulds as well and there's a real technique to that. So I wouldn't start with, I started that way, I have to, just, to, just to be clear. I started that way and I also didn't know that there were different kinds of waxes. So I was using pure soy wax to make pillar candles with. They kept breaking. It broke my heart. I didn't know what was going wrong and then I learned and now I make all sorts of pillar candles. But it's there's quite a big learning curve. With a jar candle, at least you don't have that to worry about. And tea lights are easy to make, but the thing is if you're looking for scent payoff, you don't get that. If you want to make a fragrance candle, you won't get a scent payoff from a tea light candle and you might find that disheartening as well. So I would recommend going for a jar candle first. Yeah, a tea light candle will not scent a big room. <laughs> it is more just for putting it to your nose and smelling the fragrance and then thinking, okay, I like that fragrance. I'll then purchase a larger candle of that scent. What are some ideas and tips for achieving that smooth top on the candle when we're, when we're making it? Not after it's burning and it's reset, but that initial pour and it sets on top. How do we get a smooth top? For me, it's a, a good room temperature. So, you know, the change of seasons, all through spring, I have a easy, smooth top all the time. But once you, like right now in winter, today I was down in the candle cave and I noticed I had a candle that cracked. And so that would have been, I probably would have poured it yesterday Then the temperatures dropped overnight and I came down today and it had cracked. So keeping that room temperature even, I think, is a big part of candle pouring. We're all nodding because we know how important temperature and temperature control is when making our products, but it's not always something that we can control. It's just if something goes wrong, you can usually troubleshoot as to it was the temperature that dropped too quickly or whatever it might be. So that's something to be just aware of if things aren't working perfectly in your mind or, you know, on your candles, that the temperature plays a huge part. Are there any other ways we can get a nice smooth top on our candles? I think also the temperature of the wax. So the temperature of the room and the temperature of the wax are two different things that you need to be careful of. For me, the wax I use likes to be poured real, at a really, really low temperature. And it was also about 10 degrees lower than the manufacturer recommended. So you have to play around with what temperature your wax likes to be poured at. And different fragrances also yes. will change that as well. And if all else fails, pull out the heat gun. Once yeah. the candle's set, heat gun the top. If you've got yeah. some imperfections, the heat gun the heat gun will solve everything for you. That's right. Think not how, the hair dryer. How, <laughs> not the hair dryer. But how quickly you pour your wax too. You yeah. know, flower is better than just a real quick pour. That will affect it as well. Mm -hmm. So another thing I found, I don't get a smooth top if I say I have like a 200-gram candle but only 150 grams of wax in my jug to pour and then I top it up wherever I've topped it up I'll get a sinkhole and it won't be smooth so I can't top up my candles they have to be accurate first pour so you're adding that uh, doing like a top pour no just like say I don't have enough wax for the jar like because I've miscalculated or something which happens <laughs> and um yeah so I I end up if I have to just add a little bit of extra wax to make the jar full, I'll get a sinkhole if I have to add something. And so it's worth keeping in mind that every wax behaves differently. Every wax likes a different temperature, different temperature to melt to, a different temperature to add your fragrance oil at, and a different temperature to pour it at as well. So most of the manufacturers will have recommendations. So just to really do your research and 
and test things out as well because, again, the manufacturer recommendations won't always be what works best for you in your space. So keep notes, as Sue said, document everything that you do, take note of everything and you'll find what works for you. I think the the main thing to take away when it comes to having or trying to achieve that smooth top is that it's not it's not an easy thing to achieve when there are so many different variables. When you get it, celebrate. And when you don't, pull out the heat gun. And it's not the end of the world either. <laughs> no, it's not. It's it's really not. But I think so many candle makers I speak to are aiming for perfection with every pour on every candle every time. And it's just you just put so much pressure on yourself and it's so it doesn't like it doesn't have to be perfect. You're aiming for safety first and then a great hot throw and a great cold throw and a pretty looking candle comes down the line. But unfortunately with some waxes and we can talk about which ones when the candle has been lit and then it you blow out the flame and then it sets again, sometimes that won't be a smooth experience. That will be you know, it'll be crated and it'll be, you know, bumpy. And you might think, what has happened to my candle? Can we can we share, ladies, what has happened to those candles? You've made a soy candle is what's happened. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes you're using soy wax, yes. <laughs> and, and that's an interesting point because you'll see a lot of posts on the social media, people that are just starting out and they're testing and they go, what's wrong with my candle? And it's just that it's a soy wax, but they don't realise that. There's nothing wrong. It's just that's just the yeah. way that it looks. And you see people saying it's an ugly reset. I don't, what can I do about this ugly reset? And it's it's not ugly. It's the nature of it. It's just what it does. So, uh, you know, I would encourage people to try and change their way of thinking or their mindset around that. And it's not an ugly candle. It's a soy candle. Yes. There's compromises along the way. You're not going to have the best hot throw and the best cold throw at the perfect smooth top every time, every single, like there, there are so many different variables. There are things that can go wrong or to put it a different way, there are things that you can learn from. So it's more about, like you say, Jenny, like shifting that mindset, thinking about things differently. And that all comes down to personal growth as well as educating yourself on the candle making process, which is a journey in itself. And as a consumer, I would I've done this. Go into like the Mecca website or something. All those candles that are expensive, $200, they all have paraffin in their ingredients. So if you're comparing yours to a $200 candle and why it's perfect, most of the money you're paying for is for them to market that candle, not make it. So um, I wouldn't bother comparing to expensive candles. A lot of those expensive candles have jars that are painted on the inside so they look perfect because you can't see the wax so they'll still have the wet spots but you cannot see that and I don't think having paint on the inside of your jars is healthy. I agree. How do we choose the right wick when we're making our candle? Do we go cotton? Do we go wood? I think it depends on your jar you know for the width that's how you decide whether you want two wicks but whether you want a wooden wick or a cotton wick. I think that's a personal preference. Sometimes I base it on the look of the jar. Sometimes it's on the scent. Wood wicks are much harder to work with. They're not consistent in the way they burn. I um, use a lot of tubular wicks. Have you, have you, true flame wick, have you girls seen those? Yeah. I love them. Absolutely love them. So I use them in a lot of candles. You know, if I just need it that little bit bigger, I'll add a tubular a uh, true flame wick and yeah Ooh, we might have to do some googling after that to um yeah. have a look and see what the, all that's about that sounds amazing well it gets that crackle it burns more consistently than a straight wood wick you have your uh, cotton wick on the inside of it so you're never going to have that moment where the wood wick is going to drown because it's always got the cotton wick to support it The only thing I do tell all of my candle addicts is you do need to trim it. And because it's a wood wick, it's a little bit harder. So I usually suggest toenail clippers or uh, I break it off with my fingers because that's what candle makers do. Um, (laughs) But, yeah, I I love the True Flame wood wick. It's most, out of all the wooden wicks I've used, it's the most consistent. If a candle maker, a new candle maker is trying to troubleshoot what's gone wrong, like tunnelling, or frosting or wet spots, where is the best place for them to get answers? 
I get a lot of good troubleshooting things from TikTok using TikTok as a search engine because you can see real videos from real people with the same problem or with the solution. You think they always tell the truth on TikTok? I think that it depends. Not everyone. And I think the way I tell can tell if they're being truthful or not is the type of video, what's in the background? Are they a candle maker or are they just someone who buys candles? Do they, you know, are they just in a fancy house with one candle there and they're trying to tell you how to use your candle, but they don't actually know how to use it correctly? Or are they someone with that experience and knowledge? And you can actually see like in the background, they're in their studio or something like that. Such a loaded question, Sue. (laughs) Because I think we all know the answer to that. But um, yeah, you've got to make sure that you're looking at reliable, reputable sources. And I think there are a few places that you can check, like that you can go to, whether that's um, YouTube, whether that's TikTok, whether that's the Facebook groups, whether that's your supplier. And that would be my first recommendation is to go back to your supplier. If they are worth their wedding goal, they will support you because they want you to succeed because it helps them succeed as well, right? So if you're experiencing issues with your candles, the candle making process, there are different resources that you can rely upon to get answers. Um, You don't have to do this alone. You don't have to try and figure it out on your own. You know, join the candle groups and ask questions and get support. Join the candle groups, but make use of the search function before just asking a question. Have a search first because guaranteed dozens of people have probably had the same issue and have asked. And that way you can filter through all of the advice before putting your question out there because you're not always going to get 100% lovely people answering you, depending on what groups you're in. In the Candle Business Hub and the Candle Makers Collective, you're only going to find really supportive, wonderful answers. But that's not true of all of the other groups out there. And we know that there are some people who are just out to make a point. So if you want to avoid that kind of confrontation, use the search function first. You'll probably find your answers. They also have files too, don't they? You know, you can go onto a group and go and check their files. And there's lots of informative information on those files on different topics. When it comes to experimenting with colours and fragrance, how do we even know where to begin? Do we blend fragrances? Do we stick to one fragrance per like per jar? Like how do we how do we begin the experimentation process? I think it's trial and error. I can remember when I first started, I would get a candle and I'd do three or four different colours and lay it on different angles and And then when you start burning it, it melts down to this ugly brown and it's like, okay, I need to keep the colours in the same colour family. Same with your blending. I love blending now and I like, I've I've really got into blending particularly this year because I think it cuts down on your costs. So you can have patchouli and sandalwood and you add something to patchouli and sandalwood and it just creates a whole new smell, but you're not going out and buying another scent. So you're using what you've got so I think blending is really good but keep it simple no more than two or three cents and be consistent in writing down the information like it's 50 percent each or it's you know 33 percent each and test it with a little uh, I use cotton buds little cotton bud in each one smell it see if I like it before I actually start making I think that following your instincts is a good place to start as well start with what you like Make the things that you like because you're going to be spending a lot of time with these products, especially in the early days when you're testing, testing, testing everything, and you don't know yet what your audience wants. So if you just go with the things that you like, then eventually you'll start gifting them to people to test them out, and then you'll start selling and you'll get the feedback and you'll know, oh, I'm missing this kind of fragrance or they don't actually like that one at all. And you'll you'll find that out along the way. So I think, and not everybody would recommend this, but I think it's good to start with what you like. It's your business. It's your company. What makes you happy? Also, what's been handy for me is keeping all of the fragrance oil bottles and using those for my blends. So what's in the bottle is actually never what the label says. I have, I use like masking tape to write what's actually in it. (laughs) Yeah. Keeping the bottles is a really good way when you're blending scents to keep that scent if you find something that works. I think it's a lot of fun, like the process of creating a new scent that's uniquely yours for you and your business is, it's an adventure. Sometimes you'll mix, you know, two scents together that you love separately, but when they're combined, it becomes this 
this other scent that you think, oh, I don't know if that's going to perform as well, you know, even for myself to enjoy or to sell as a product. So have fun with it. Just enjoy learning about how to blend fragrances, consider the flashpoints and the the different fragrance families. And there's a lot that you can learn about that. And that can be a whole adventure on its own. But start small, start slowly, take your time and just build up your knowledge as you go. I think that so many people are so keen just to get to the end point, the, the success that they desire, that rushing through it means they're not actually enjoying it as much as they could. And you've got time, you've got you've got the space to enjoy the process. So just, yeah, slow down a little bit, I think, is the point I'm trying to make. I think blending is good too for new candle makers, simply because they're creating a scent that their customers can't get anywhere else. So it gives them a point of difference rather than just going in and going, what's the most popular scent? I need to make that. They create their own and that's that point of difference for them. Mm -hmm. being unique in the market when there are so many different candle makers and the amount of candle makers in the industry will come and go will fluctuate over time but if you don't enjoy the scents that you're making and you (laughs) almost dread making that particular scent candle just because you think it might sell you're not going to enjoy the process Mm -hmm. you need to make candles that you like to make and then when you're a bit more experienced you know what your particular customers are wanting then you can branch out into maybe adding some colour or blending fragrances or trying different things. But take your time, have fun and enjoy the process. When it comes to packaging our candles and making them look nice and pretty for shipping or for our customers, do we have any tips on the presentation side of things? I like to, my whole theme is to reuse, recycle. So I don't like to use boxes because I feel like boxes, they cost a fair amount of money. People go, oh, my God, the boxes are pretty. But then when they get home, generally they get thrown away. I myself have little cotton bags with my business name on the front of the cotton bags and I pop the candles into the cotton bag and then I put them in a paper bag. Yeah, I I don't like cardboard boxes just simply because they get thrown away. At least with the cotton bags, I tell people, you know, when you're done with it, you can use it when you're traveling, you can throw your jewelry in it, you can use the bags again. For me, it's safety first. I have had, in the last year, so I've had a candle business for a year now, I've had three candles break in transit. And when I look at how they're packaged, it was when I was trialing the hex wrap, you know, the yeah bubble wrap substitute. When it was just in the hex wrap, it was not enough to stop it from breaking in transit. So if you're shipping candles, I definitely think packing peanuts Mm. has been the best way for things not to break. And I've just started using a box within a box. So I'll put the candle into a box and then put that into a shipping box with more packing peanuts because I'm just so paranoid because it's glass. Yeah, that's why I don't do postage. Yeah. What about you, Jenny? I largely sell at markets at the moment and I always give people the option, would you like a box or not? And most of the time they'll say no, but I do like to give them that option in case it's a gift, but I don't, I haven't spent a whole lot of money getting boxes printed up. I buy some very plain boxes that are uncoated so they can be easily recycled and I use my rubber stamp and I put my logo on it that way because the same for me as with Sue, um, environmental sustainability is a really big part of my of my brand values. And so I try to reduce packaging as much as possible. So I try to make a box an option. If I'm shipping, I absolutely use a box and I wrap it with tissue paper inside the box. Then I'll use hex wrap or packing peanuts or bubble wrap that I've reused from somewhere else. All of those kind of things, anything to make it feel good. And um, I haven't had any breakages so far, but I also haven't sent out loads of orders. Like I've, I've probably sent less than a dozen orders. I haven't been selling online for very long. So, so far, so good. A hundred percent success rate so far. hundred percent success rate. Yeah. Same like, with Sue. She said none. So she's had no breakages. So a hundred percent success rate for Sue as well. <laughs> Candle scent names. Do we keep the name from the bottle or do we put our spin on it? I put my spin on it. When I first started, I changed every single name. Again, so the candle addicts, they would come and that name wasn't anywhere else, so it was a scent that was only available to me. Sometimes now 
further down the track. I won't change the name because it's such a, a popular smell. So patchouli and sandalwood and vanilla, I call it as it is because as soon as people walk over, oh, patchouli and sandalwood, I love it. I would say maybe 70% of mine are not the original name from the candle suppliers and 30% are. What about you, Alicia? For me, I like changing them because of my brand. I pretty much have to change them because none of them fit in with my brand. But I like changing them because I don't want to be the same and I don't want a customer to Google a scent and have my supplier come up. That's a good point. Me to come up. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. A lot of scent methods, fragrances, people don't change. So if they were to Google that scent name, scent method would just come up. It never occurred to me that you could just keep it the same as what was on the bottle. I, I started rebranding all of mine from, from the start. Most of mine I have blended myself anyway, so that, that helps with that. And also with my branding, it's, you know, a bit cute, a bit kind of tongue-in-cheek. So I, I rename all of them. I try and make it really snappy and the, the thing is, though, then people don't always know what it's about. I've got a candle called Amore. I've got one called Comfort. And then that doesn't really let you know what it is. So when I'm selling at the markets, I make sure I have scent profile cards printed up that I have laid out on my table. And it talks about all the notes that are in them, the base notes, middle notes, top notes, and what the actual kind of composition of it is with pictures as well. So people can instantly look at it. They go, oh, Comfort, what does that mean? They look at it quickly. Oh, it's lavender vanilla. Okay, I get it. I think another another thing to come back to is that just have fun with it rather than it has to be called, it has to be what the bottle says. You know, let your, like, let your creativity come out. Have fun with it. Think about what your brand represents, how you want people to interact with you and your business. I don't know about you guys, but I find a lot of scents that I smell in the bottle or when I make it into a candle doesn't actually smell like what the name suggests it is. That's true. So then that would be pointless calling it that. When it comes to pricing, what are our thoughts? How do we help new candle makers with their pricing of their products? I really love to use the Shopify. You can just Google it, Shopify Wholesale Calculator. All of my wholesale pricing is marked up by 125% and all of my retail marked up by 400 So I literally just put in the cost in one column, how much I want it marked up by percent in the next, and then it calculates it. And that's how I do it. Nice, simple, easy, quick. Yeah. What about you, Jenny? What would you say in terms of advice for pricing? Think about where you want your brand to sit in the market. If you really just want to make something very, very affordable for people, then that's very different from if you're trying to create a luxury product. And so it's um, you really need to think about your positioning and where you want to fit in. And I think it can be really helpful to look at other brands and see what they're selling for, but then also keep in mind things like what Alicia was saying earlier. These big brands, they might be 500% of their price might be marketing costs. So that's probably not where most of us are aiming. If you are, go for it. But see what feels right for you, where your brand is going to sit and have it have it do a bit of a comparison. You don't necessarily need to match them or try and undercut them, but it gives you a good idea of what other people in the industry are doing and where you feel like you fit in in terms of the way you present your brand. What about you, Sue? Well, coming from the market perspective, one of the biggest things I see when a new candle maker comes to the market is how cheap their candles are. So just say I I might see someone with a 300-gram candle and I, I recognise the jar, I know where it's come from, I know how much it's cost, and that jar by itself may be $8 and they're selling them for 20 so by the time you factor in the cost of the wax and your time, they're probably making a dollar, maybe $2. So I think costing is really, really important. And when you're a new candle maker, you just can't sort of pull that cost out of the air. So I think, like Alicia said, you know, if you can get some sort of formula and work a formula, don't don't undersell yourself because that's where most people go wrong. They do the markets for six months and never come back because they're not making any money. Um, But I also think when you're a new candle maker, you probably need to get some sort of accounting package or a spreadsheet because there are so many other factors that you need to add in. You need to add in your market costs. You need to 
add in your insurance, you need to add in the cost of your tags and your warning labels and all of those things, they all affect the overall cost of your candle. So don't undersell yourself and be realistic with the prices. Yes, I feel like so many people want to have the, the cheapest candle to sell because they think that'll get them more sales. But the price is a big indicator on the type of customers that your brand will attract as well. So it's not just about, you know, trying to grab as many sales as you can. If you're not covering your costs, you're going to run yourself into the ground. If you're picking the price that you're selling for out of thin air, like you say, Sue, mm. what's it based on? How can you scale a business if you haven't done your due diligence and the proper research to figure out what your costs are, factoring in everything, including your time. That is so important not to forget you in the equation and then marking up for wholesale as well as your retail costs. So there are lots of different calculators and things online. I love Alicia's suggestion of using the Shopify calculator as well. Um, Make sure you're spending some time in the financial part of your business And if you have an accountant or if you want accounting software or if you use a spreadsheet, figure out how to use those to the best of your ability and to make them work for you. What about marketing? How do we get our candles out there? It's hard enough to make them and make them safe to sell and beautiful and perfect and all the things. How do we then find customers to sell our products to? I think Alicia's (laughs) the point of this. I think there's only two ways, markets in person or social media. I think that, yeah, and for either of them, I think you have to be consistent in whichever one you choose or both. What about you, Sue? You're very much into the market scene as well as you, Jenny, as well. How do you get people to stop walking past your stall and come in and interact with you? I I think it's more than just going to the market or selling on social media. It's a whole picture. So when you first start out, you need to find your style that's all part of the marketing. You know, when you, might, um, when you make your tags and your labels, keep them all colour coordinated. Keep the font the same. Use the same font all the time. Don't have a font that's really hard to read. That's all part of the marketing and it's part of the image. I use a lot of gold, classic clear and grey candles and all of my ribbons, tags, They're all colour-coded, so it's all colour-coded. Even when I go to the markets, what I wear, generally I try to get that whole vibe. You know, I I won't go in bright colours because that's not my candle style. But I think there's lots of things. You want someone to look at your candles and go, oh, they are really, really nice. So it's all of those things. It's so true. It really does encompass your whole brand. It's not just making a candle, slapping a label on <laughs> and saying it's now available for sale. There are, there are so many intricacies to uh, and factors to, to think about. And that's where it's important to start, you know, educating yourself on, you know, what books are out there? What podcasts can I listen to other than this podcast? Yeah. What podcasts are there that you can learn about marketing, learn about branding, learn about the art of selling and, you know, absorbing all of that information and making it work for you and applying it in ways that make sense for you and your business. It is so multi-layered and it is so overwhelming at times, but again, just take it one step at a time and educate yourself slowly if, if you are feeling overwhelmed. What about you, Jenny? How do we get people to stop at our stall <laughs> if we are running at a market? Smelling amazing is, yeah. is a really good way. And if you're at an indoor market, I recommend taking something you can put a wax melt in, something you yes. can just plug in to a power bank and amplify that. Um, a lot of people stop at my stall because they say, oh, my God, it smells amazing here. Mm. I feel delighted every time. Even if I'm at an outdoor market, as much as I can, I put the sides up on my marquee. I have a bright pink marquee. My branding is all quite colourful. It's very pink, purple and green. I have beautiful tablecloths that my mum made for me, handmade in the same colour. Um, so everything is, as Sue was saying, everything is on brand. Everything is themed. There's nothing there that doesn't fit. So somebody who's an absolute minimalist is probably going to walk on because they'll think this is chaotic. And I'm, I'm where's where's the beautiful sleek white? It's 
it's at the candle maker down the road. It's not at my tent. But all of that kind of stuff, it does catch people's eye. For for the people who are my customer, it catches their eye, the, the pink marquee. And then once I've got the sides up as well, it helps to trap the fragrance in. So you've got that beautiful smell that people are going to be drawn to. Um, I put my wax melts at the end of the table that's closest to the path and I have them so that people can pick them up and they're colourful as well. And there's a sort of a, a chart with the fragrances on. So people will pick them up and get their friend to smell it. What do you think this one is? Oh, I like this one. And their friend will say, oh, no, I don't like that one at all. I like this one. And it, it's quite fun and it becomes an activity for them to get involved in. And that's a great way that I then draw people into the tent and then they start talking to me and I can explain things to them. Yes. And I think um, I know we've sort of just taken a tangent into the market realm, but being up off your chair, not on your phone, doing yes. You know, being happy that you're there it makes a big difference as well as opposed to, yeah, sitting in your chair and just looking down and being disheartened that you haven't sold all your candles by 11 a.m. By interacting with the market goers, it elevates your, you know, your your level of enjoyment and excitement and people are drawn to that as well. So, yes, very much about the brand, the look, the feel, and you as the, the candle maker and business owner presenting your best self. Uh, when you're at the market and then when it comes to social media which Alicia is the queen of (laughs) it's very much about that consistency isn't it yeah definitely consistency and even kind of the same things that um, Sue and Jenny were saying when I film a video like I try and get my nails done to match my brand or I'll wear a brown top or I even will put bronzer on my face and just bronzer because I don't really like makeup just so I can tie in that earthy colour to the videos. So, yeah, I think it's, yeah, consistency and people like knowing, that familiarity of people knowing what they're looking at, whether it's a market stall or a video or something. One of the last questions I want to touch on tonight, ladies, is how do we differentiate ourselves from other candle makers? We've touched on that a little bit tonight, but I just want to sort of hone in on how do we set ourselves apart from being just another candle maker? Probably one of the most valuable pieces of information that I learned at the start of my business journey was you are your brand. And as long as you are staying true to yourself, you're not going to be doing the same thing as anybody else. It's just kind of impossible. So as much as you can inject your own personality into what you're doing, you will be set apart. What about you, Sue? If I was a new candle maker now, and I was thinking about making candles, I would actually go to market and see what's being sold and they would be the things that I wouldn't do. I would look for something different, like everybody was selling white jars. Well, I wouldn't sell a white jar. So I think it's finding your own little spot. Such good advice. And then what about you, Alicia? I agree with Jenny. I think as long as you're authentic and true to yourself, then you won't be like anybody else out there. Beautiful. Is there anything else, ladies, that you would like to share with listeners, the newer candle makers that are perhaps at the beginning of their journey and maybe are feeling a little bit disheartened that they haven't perfected their candle yet or just some general encouragement? It can be overwhelming. Just know that that's part of the process and try not to let it get you down. Find resources like this where you can hear other candle makers talking and you'll hear it's been a process and it's an ongoing process for all of us. So you're not on your own, you're not failing. It, there's there's a lot to be done and it can feel like too much sometimes, but there are ways to move forward and having a support system is really important. Get yourself a support system professionally and personally. What about you, Sue? I think for new candle makers, everybody's journey is different and everybody wants a different goal. So the way I do it is not going to be the same as the way Alicia does it. You just need to go at your own pace. Don't get shiny object syndrome. Write down your goals and try to stick to them, but everybody's going to do it differently and try and enjoy it. You know, don't get worked up. And as long as you know you're not going to become a millionaire overnight, you know, just go for it. I love that. And then to round us out, Alicia, what is your advice and encouragement? I think it's to find legitimate support resources like the Candle Makers Collective or Candle Business Hub and not get sucked in by online coaches like that just sell you their funnel and that's it or send you 
ridiculously long emails that takes you half an hour to read but gives you no value. Like be careful of who you trust because there are legitimate support resources out there. I think it's just so important to remember that when you're at the start of your journey, not to compare yourself well to anyone, but particularly to anyone that's further along. If you're looking at the you know, still small business, but the bigger brands that are that you know that have lots of followers and seem to get lots of sales every day. Don't get disheartened if you're not there yet, because A, it might not be where you want to go anyway. And B, they're further along than you. They've had more time to learn about business, to learn about marketing, to learn about how to run their business and how to make candles and how to do it quickly and make bulk batches and all the things. There's so many different elements to it. It will take time to get to where you're going. And that's why it's a journey. It's not just a, you know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, all those beautiful cliches. It's so important to, as you say, Sue, to enjoy the process and enjoy the journey because it's going to take more than what you think, like more resources than you think. That's time, that's money, that's energy to make safe candles, to make well-performing candles and build up that customer base. Every little win should be celebrated. Every challenge is an opportunity to learn and grow. And it's just about enjoying that journey overall and by listening to these episodes where we can all like, like these candle maker connections where you're hearing from different candle makers and hearing from different business owners it's hopefully reassuring to you that everyone's journey is so different and that's why I'm so grateful to have Jenny Sue and Alicia on tonight to chat about how we can help newer candle makers and I know that there are so many more directions we can take this conversation so please feel free to send any of us a DM if you do have questions um, about anything and we can help direct you to the right resources so know that you're not alone and just enjoy the journey thank you jenny sue and alicia for being on tonight's podcast episode candle maker connections number three three in the bag and many more to come it's been a real joy chatting to you tonight and i appreciate each and every one of you Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, my friend, for listening to this episode. Check out the show notes for all the links mentioned throughout the conversation and please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any future episodes. And if you're feeling inspired, I would love it if you would write a review for the podcast and give a five-star rating. Thank you so much and have a beautiful day. Mm-hmm.